So this will be my last talk of the day. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed doing this. Uh, this is a nice segue from the last talk, which was talking about uh, reducing various joints. And sometimes you will need procedural sedation. So this is best practices with regards to procedural sedation. So after this, you should have some more information, feel much more confident about performing these in your institution. Now, each of your institutions and the place where you work will have rules and conditions about this. So please make sure you're adhering to those within your own uh, community and within your own institution with regards to who can do what and what can you do and which drugs can you do. So if you're not doing any of these things, just take it back as information to give to the appropriate committee like the P&T committee or the emergency department committee so you get everybody on board before you start doing these. So the objectives, I have two objectives for this half hour lecture. The one is that I want you to understand the components with regards to the patient selection. All right, when you're doing procedural sedation, select your patients carefully. Monitor those patients that you do sedate carefully and have good discharge instructions for those patients when they're going home. And then the second thing is, I want you to know the indications and contraindications, the pros and the cons, the upsides and the downsides to various pharmacological agents that we can use to sedate people. I mean, the joke in emergency medicine right now is ketamine? What was the question? Because it seems to be the answer for everything these days. But we're going to talk about ketamine, propofol, Ketafol, where you combine those two drugs, it's the Hannah Montana of sedation. It's the best of both worlds. And I only say that because I found out at dinner last night that Miley Cyrus is playing here in Vegas. Anybody go to it? Oh yeah, did she come in like a wrecking ball? <laughs> All right, and uh, nitrous oxide, okay, which isn't used very often, apparently, in the US. It's like the Australians and the New Zealand, there's somebody here from New Zealand, it's used quite frequently there and dental offices seem to be able to use this all the time. All right, so just a quick review, uh, start with a definition of procedural sedation. It's not a dichotomous thing. Procedural sedation is on a spectrum. You're fully awake and conscious and aware, and you're unconscious. That's the dichotomy, but we're looking for somewhere in between in that Goldilocks zone. So we don't want people completely unconscious, but we don't want them awake and necessarily aware of what we're doing. And so there's mild, moderate, and deep sedation. It's not an on-off switch when it comes to procedural sedation. So how low do you go with these patients? Now, I always like to throw this because it's an oxymoron when I hear patients, or uh, sorry, people say conscious sedation. That's an oxymoron. It's like fresh frozen plasma, fresh frozen, no. Jumbo shrimp, no. Act naturally. Plastic silverware and old news. All right, it's a oxymoron. So it's not conscious sedation. They're not consciously sedated. You are procedurally providing them with some sedation. All right, and so when you're talking about this first objective, I always want you to think airway because we're in emergency medicine, so we're thinking ABCs. You're at the ABC course, the advanced boot camp. You want to think A, and I can say that. How's it going, A? Eh? So A, think airway, and then have good clinical judgment about that, and that involves patient selection and what you're doing, and that's the real take-home message when it comes to procedural sedation. Always be prepared to grab that airway if the person goes too deep. And you can have that. And the classic example is the person who comes in with the shoulder dislocation. And they usually come in, uh, 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 right? And it hurts a lot. The shoulder's out. You've got this squared off joint. They're in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, right? And you can't get it in through the Cunningham technique, through the scapular rotation, and you've tried. It doesn't work 100%. So you're going to do procedural sedation. You're going to start a line, and you're going to give them pr some procedural sedation. And the classic example is you give them some fentanyl, maybe some propofol, right? And they're in a lot of pain and their blood pressure is really high. And what happens as soon as you pop that shoulder back in, thunk, and all of a sudden their sats start dropping and you're like, oh crap, right? Sternal rub, right? And so there are some risks and you've got to be prepared for the bad outcomes so you can address them in advance, know about them, be prepared. Think airway, have good clinical judgment. 
So when it comes to airway, yep, you gotta have that stethoscope ready, but you also have to have oral airways there. You've gotta have superglottic devices if you're just gonna throw one of those in, and you have to be able to intubate, and hopefully it never comes to the point where you have to crike them. So, difficult airway or easy airway? What do you think? Do you think this is easy or difficult? This is, um, in, we're in a world of emojis, right? Would this get a happy face emoji or would this get, oh, I crap my pants? <laughs> if you had to take this airway, it'd be like, oh, re when's my shift over? Really? Okay, and so here's an algorithm as an example that you could take back to your institution with regards to an, uh, running an anesthetic. And the only reason I put this in here is because there's a part within the anesthetist world on scheduled sedations, scheduled intubations. And I'm going to zoom in with the miracle of technology to this part of it about awake intubations. And when you look at that and it's dichotomized in, you get an in invasive airway or you go down the part where you're on an airway approach that's non-invasive. You succeed, great. But if you go down that middle part and you fail, right? You fail, cancel the case, right? And I want that to be a take-home message. If you have a patient with that neck beforehand, right, and go, how bad do I need to put that joint back in? And can I do it safely here with the personnel, the equipment, the drugs, and my knowledge? Or should I just cancel the case? That's the anesthetic world. So should I just walk away and say, no, this is not, I'm not the right person. Remember, it's sort of like general surgeons. One of the most difficult decisions they have to make is when not to operate. And so one of the difficult, intelligent, high thought decisions you have to make is when not to sedate. Feel free to cancel the procedure, depending on what you have to do. All right, so looking at the patient, patient, she doesn't look sick, right? She doesn't look sick. This looks like somebody who would tolerate a procedure with some sedation. Get a past medical history. Find out how many comorbidities do they have. Is their best O2 sat sitting at 89, 90% at the best of times, right? How good are they going into the sedation? Are they pregnant? And in the anesthetic world, it's like, when did they last eat? That does not come into my metric or my decision-making process if the patient needs it for life or limb. And the American College of Emergency Physicians said, listen, if you're saving the limb, if you're saving a life, I don't care. We use the seafood, they, ASAP doesn't use this, but I use the seafood uh, approach to it. I look in their mouth. If I don't see food, we're doing this, okay? Right, because it's life or limb. So that's my seafood technique. So make sure, you know, sure, but if they've just had this, you know, they've just gone through this drive through window and had this, you know, all you can eat buffet, right, in Vegas, you may not need to put that joint in right away, depending on the joint, okay? Or you might do a local block on the finger before you use procedural sedation to put that finger back in. All right, and then you have risk stratification based on one to five. And you can document the ASA if you want. I don't. I usually describe the patient, right? Are they a normal, healthy patient who's in a good position? Or are they down at the bottom, number five? Are they morbid patient, not expected to survive more than 24 hours? Do they look really bad? Somewhere along there. So select your patients carefully when you're doing procedural sedation. So here we have a few. Ask yourself, before you go into a procedural sedation, you already have to have, it's, it's plan A. I know you're going to do procedural sedation, but plan A is what happens if I lose the airway, right? That's plan A. So you should have plan A before you do procedural sedation. Can I bag this patient? Look at that gentleman with the heavy, heavy beard. Do you want to bag that? Are you going to get a good seal on that? That's going to be quite difficult, isn't it? What is his chin? I have no idea what his chin looks like. Um, so one of the things you can do as a MacGyver thing that I learned from a nurse was that you can put one of those tegaderms over there and put, poach puncture a hole in it and put it over the beard and then you can get a mask seal where the tag ah oh, something to take home little clinical pearl yeah so take a tegaderm right it's almost lacks like cellophane wrap you put it over the beard and then you can put the mask on and you get a much better seal you don't have to shave them if you've got a, a critical situation uh, can i tube this patient and that's that person down in the bottom left no chin right what is their mal and patty? I don't know, we'd have to look in their mouth. 
right? But that looks like a difficult intubation there. So know it in advance. And again, I showed you that earlier picture about the high, hard to crike. So can I tube this patient? There's the lemon mnemonic that they teach in ACLS and ATLS. Look at the general anatomy. Do your three, three, two rule. So three, can I, ah, 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 ah. can I get three fingers? Can they open their mouth three fingers? Three fingers here and two fingers here. So it's three, three, two, right? For your three, three, two. Then look in their malum patty. Can you see that uvula dangling or is it getting more and more obscure? And each of these is on a spectrum which will make it more and more difficult and you've got to weigh that clinically with your good clinical judgment of whether you can do that. And then risk and benefit, so patient selection. This isn't the greatest picture of a uh, uh, dislocated hip. It's usually more internally rotated, right? It, the one up on the pillow is the dislocation, right? And it's toes going up and, up and down while in the relaxed position, his right leg, which is on the screen on the left, is sitting externally rotated a bit, but it's that right side of the screen, the patient's left up on a pillow that's internally rotated compared to the other one and shortened. All right, so a posterior hip dislocation. You've got to weigh the risk and the benefit. And so here it is, there's your dislocated hip. There's your posterior dislocated hip. It's not an artificial joint. It has vasculature there. It has nerves and vasculature there. And if you don't get that hip in, the longer you leave it out, the more likely it is to have a vascular injury and go to avascular necrosis and lose their hip. And so dead hip versus dead patient. That's the balance. Yes, dead patient is much worse, but what's the risk? In this evaluation, it's smaller. If you have a reasonable patient, reasonably healthy, you've done your lemon, you've looked at their mal and patty, you've thought, could I take this person's airway? If I did, procedural sedation. The Whistler technique didn't work to put it back in. I'm gonna have to go to procedural sedation. Can I take this person's airway? There's a big risk to losing the hip and a small risk for their life if they're a good patient based on your patient selection. So risk versus benefit. Now when it comes to monitoring, JCO has a standard thing. You guys can read. I can read that out to you, but this is what JCO says. And they say that you need to be aware of this and monitor patients based on this expectation. So that's a slide for you to know when you're back in your institution. And then when you come to monitoring, okay, so pre-anesthetic pre -anesthetic assessment, yes. Before I sedate this patient, I'm gonna just check them out. I've got a plan individualized for each patient. And I've discussed with the patient the potential risks to doing the procedure. And then I'm gonna put monitors. All the equipment that's on this table, I want on that person's chest. I want that O2 sat, I want that heart rate monitoring. I want the difficult airway cart at my side before I do procedural sedation. I want it there in case I need it. And usually, you don't need it. But if you don't bring it, that'll be, the that'll be the time where you crap your pants. And it's like, really? It had to happen now, okay? And then every patient needs a post-procedural assessment to make sure they're okay. And so here's a picture with the monitor. You need to have sufficient personnel. So you have to have enough people that can do the procedure with you. You have to have enough personnel that can be monitoring the procedure so they can be paying attention to the monitor. Because you might sit there and be focused in on the shoulder, focused in on the hip, focused in on whatever their procedure, and may not notice that it's boop, 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 boop. Oh, I know that algorithm from ACLS, by the way. It's one algorithm I really know well, asystole. Um, but we have something called a, uh, attention blindness. H have you guys ever seen the video of the uh, basketball video, the psychology video of passing a basketball? Have you guys seen that? Oh, I don't want to give you, don't tell anybody what it's about, okay? <laughs> All right, so go to YouTube. It's a psychology experiment where they pass a, vid a basketball back and forth between a group of young people and you're expected to count how many times the basketball is passed between the group. And it's about inattention or attention blindness. When we're paying attention, a lot of attention to one thing, we miss other things. So you need people to be watching the monitor helping you with that. Make sure you have the appropriate equipment and have a second backup. You've got your MacGyver stuff with you in case this doesn't work. I'm gonna get out the towel clamp, I'm gonna freeze that first, and then I'm gonna lift up that dislocated uh, sternoclavicular joint. Um, monitoring vital signs, document and document and monitor the outcome. All right, and then discharge. Here's what I say. 
once they're back to normal, their normal, right, Abby normal, but once they're back to their normal, right, they can go home. And I usually say, after you've had procedural sedation, after you've had a difficult experience, after I've had to do something like that, my advice is nada until tomorrow. Nada. Nada doesn't stand for anything other than you're nada going to do that. Okay? So if they've got a hockey game that night, nada going to do that. If they've got some kind of event planned, uh, my recommendation was you're not going to do that. Okay? They've had enough serious medical conditions to require procedural sedation where we've had to use mind-altering drugs and pay, put a joint back in or do something that I think that they deserve a day off. All right, now for objective number two. This was the best picture I could find for psychedelic when I was putting these slides together. But discuss the indications and contraindications of ketamine, propofol, ketofol, and nitrous oxide in the emergency department. That was the second objective of this procedural sedation talk. And so, propofol. I love propofol. It's the milk of amnesia. It works really well, okay? But there are some good things about propofol, and there's some bad things. Every time I come to one of these sessions and I sit with the rest of the faculty, I learn from them. And listening to Diane Birnbaumer yesterday talk about, you know, when the patient drops, what's your, what's your best, you know, drug to use? I love her answer. It all depends. I'm going to individualize it. I'm going to customize it. I'm going to make sure I do the best for that patient in front of me. And to know how to do that, you need to know what that patient's like and what are the properties of the agent you're going to use. So when it comes to propofol, there are some pros and cons, just like any drug. Any drug can have a positive effect or a negative effect. Any drug can have potential benefit or potential harm. From yesterday, the IOTA study, oxygen is a drug. It has potential benefit. It has potential harm. So it's a general anesthetic. We want to sedate this person. That's good. It's quick on and off. I love that. It's an antiemetic because a lot of people especially children, end up throwing up when they're in a lot of pain. An anticonvulsant, so it's going to lo lower seizure threshold and um, uh, lowers the ICP, so the intracranial pressure. But on the other side, it is a general anesthetic. You give them enough and they will be down and down deep. And we've had some high-profile media cases about celebrities. There's a show here on Vegas, not about, well, it's about the celebrity, but not about the event, who had, used, had been using propofol to help get to sleep in their home. Okay, so propofol should be used in a supervised medical situation with monitors, right? <laughs> because it can be dangerous. And so it can cause severe hypotension. And that's the case I talked about where the person you're popping the shoulder back in. And you pop the shoulder back in, there's a whoosh and a release of pain. And it's like, ah, and their pressure just tanks. So one of the things, especially if I've got, usually in elderly patients, mature patients as I approach them, I say, well, based on your maturity, usually they're hypertensive. Usually they're 160, 170, 180 with the pain. So I've got a big cushion, but if they're soft and they're, they're, they're an elderly patient and they're on blood pressure pills because of a history of hypertension and their systolic is already sitting at 95, propofol is not my drug of choice because I know I'm going to lose some numbers there. You can always buffer that by giving them a bit of fluid bolus, and that'll be a temporizing thing until the propofol wears off. It says here that it burns like hell. I'm going to change the side. It burns. I don't know if it burns like hell. I frame it for people. If you put it in the hand, if you put the IV in the hand, and you push the propofol in the hand, it burns. It stings, right? It doesn't burn as much if you put it in the antecubital fossa. But what I do is I tell people, I reframe it and I say, oh, we're going to, you know, you're in a lot of pain. Uh, we're going to have to do some procedural sedation if that's okay, which means we're just going to sedate you a bit, right, to get this shoulder back in, let's say. Now, this medicine has a little bite to it. Oh, it's strong stuff, right? And so if you feel the burning, it means it's working, right? And so it's how you frame it, right? I do the same thing with Ketorolac. There is no good evidence that ketorolac is vastly superior to any other NSAID other than the fact that you can give it parenterally, right? You can give it as an IM or IV drug. But has anybody here had Toradol personally? I have. The injection, it hurts, right? Ooh, that's strong stuff. The doctor's giving me a needle. He's really concerned about my pain, and it burns, 
right? And so if you frame that, I, don't, I think I'm going to remove that. It burns like hell. It does burn. It has a bite to it. This is a powerful pharmaceutical agent. This is a strong drug. So if you feel some burning and tingling in your vein, that just means it's working. It's not an allergic reaction. It's working. And that usually is fine. And I don't usually mix it with lidocaine. And then there's some worries or concerns about allergies with soy and egg that you could have an allergic reaction with propofol. Ketamine, oh, what doesn't it do? Special K, sending people down the K-hole. What I really like about ketamine and what I'm using it mostly for now is um, for people that come in quite agitated, really, really agitated. And I, like I said, I work in a uh, single coverage critical access hospital. You know, the security system is Brenda, me, you know, like it, it's usually, you know, one nurse, maybe two nurses during busy times of the day. And if you have a very violent patient, we don't have on-site security and stuff like that. We'd have to call the police to come there. I use ketamine and it's four milligrams per kilogram IM. And then everybody in the department's happy. And one of the key things is it doesn't affect your airway. They've done some studies in the US looking at pre-hospital people using EMS uh, services, using 500 milligrams of ketamine, regardless of the patient's size for adults. And they give them 500 milligrams of ketamine IM. And they come in GCS of three right? But this is for the very violent patient where they're going to hurt themselves or they're going to hurt the staff. The part of that study that was a bit concerning is that a great, um, very many got intubated, but it was because one physician in that study group was quite concerned these people coming in with a GCS of three. It was just because of the ketamine. It doesn't affect their ability to breathe, and he was worried and he intubated them. It doesn't necessarily need to be intubated because it doesn't affect the airway, and that's in my pro-cons. Yes, it's a general anesthetic, both sides, but the airway reflexes are maintained when you use ketamine. This is a super safe drug. I have made medical errors. I admit I've made medical errors. I am not perfect, right? And I've given an inappropriate right, dose as a medical error for ketamine. I'm being honest and transparent. The only harm is, I mean, their patient is out, they're just out longer, right? And the airway is protected, but they were out for an extended period of time because of the ketamine. And it was in a small, uh, small individual, a pediatric case. Um, occasionally you'll get laryngeal spasm. I haven't had that experience. I use it a lot, but I am prepared for it. Occasionally a child will freak out, not usually a grown up, but a child will freak out as they come out of it an emergent phenomenon. So imagine if you give a dissociative drug to a five-year-old, right, and they're scared, and then they come out of it in a dream state, and it's like their teddy bear has fallen off a cliff, right, or something is terrorizing that child from that dissociative experience. With adults, we're seeing this, you know, to prevent this in adults, um, you may have heard of sub-dissociative dose of ketamine for pain control, and they may have talked about it earlier in this course, 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, if you're doing sub-dissociative drugs where they're not completely out, they can have that sort of nebula. I just talk to them and say, where would you like to go on holidays? What would be your best place? Where's your happy place? So I, I try to plant that seed of, of imagery into their head before I push the drug. So when they're coming out of the drug, that's the last thing they remember. And it's something pleasant to try to negate that. And then vomiting. Ketamine is associated with the vomiting. Again, I see it in children with the emergent phenomenon and the vomiting. So you need to be prepared in case they're coming out of the ketamine. You've got to be able to roll them over the side. You've got to have suction at the bedside. And I tell people in advance, this is one of the common side effects. It doesn't mean you're going to have it, but it is a possibility. But you could do the best of both worlds. You could do ketamine and propofol. It raises the blood pressure ketamine. Propofol lowers it. You could find a Goldilocks zone. Same thing with intracranial pressure analgesic effect with ketamine, not with propofol. That's why it's propofol. You have to add fentanyl or something else for an analgesic effect. And you could use both. Now, I, I switched these by accident. They should be on the other side. It's, a, pr it, it's a, um, a con that it's two drugs. Sorry, I made a mistake on this slide. Like I said, I'm not perfect. The pro is that you use lower doses of both drugs and therefore mitigating the adverse effects, okay? Ketofol. And then there's nitrous oxide. They used to be in the department, but it found out that um, some, of the depart some of the staff in the department were really happy all the time, and they were always out of nitrous. <laughs> I'm just saying that's an association, not causation. All we know is we have empty nitrous tanks, and we have happy staff. That's all I'm saying. 
Um, and so also, you know, you needed special scavengering devices to mop it all up because women, uh, early pregnancy, there's concerns about early pregnancy with regards to nitrous. Um, uh, but this is often used in pediatric departments. But now they have these little canisters, right? These little disposable canisters, they're self-contained, and you can deliver nitrous oxide all in the self-contained thing, so you don't have to worry about potential abuse, and you also don't have to worry about scavenging devices for the nitrous oxide, and it can be used in late pregnancy. Uh, the pro uh, for this is no loss of consciousness. It's an anxiolytic, so it can just calm people down. They use this out in ski hills. There's some studies looking at it for people who have dislocated a shoulder, or dislocated a hip. They don't put them back on the hill, or they can't get it back on the hill. They can have them in the ambulance while they're heading down the hill to the hospital, usually on one of those uh, ski doos or something like that. Uh, they can have nitrous being provided, and it's an anxi anxiolytic, and it has some analgesic properties but there's a concern uh, with pneumothorax and bowel obstructions. Never seen either of those because we don't use a lot of nitrous. So the take home points from this talk uh, are think the airway. If you are doing procedural sedation, your first thought is I have plan A. I have a way to take this person's airway. I am going to be able to manage this person's airway. I'm gonna be able to grab their airway. I am going to be monitoring this patient throughout the procedure. I'm gonna do a very careful selection of these patients using my clinical judgment to select the right patients and the right procedural sedation agent to provide them and know, is it life-threatening? Is it limb-threatening? Do I really need to do this? And knowing that I can always walk away and be safe, all right, because we want to be safe in these procedural sedations. So think airway when you're starting procedural sedation, when you're saying, I think I need to do a procedural sedation on this individual and use your good clinical judgment. You have it. Pick your patients carefully, monitor those patients, and pick your drugs. Individualize it, like Dr. Birnbaumer said. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. I'm heading home <laughs> to the Great White North. Um, this is a fantastic course. If you are a full-on nerd like me and you like this nerdiness, um, I do have my podcast series that you can go to. It is free. It's something that I think that people should get the best care based on the best evidence. So it's something I do all in my own time for people so that they can have access. It's called The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, the SGEM. And if you go to thesgem.com, every week you will see a new post with a 2,000-word blog entry critically reviewing a recent publication, and it'll be combined with a 20-minute podcast that starts with 80s theme music, <laughs> with me attempting to sing that 80s theme music at the beginning that sort of summarizes the paper or leads you into the paper. Anyways, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yay, Ken.